Thank you very much, Suzanne. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I appreciate that uh, introduction. I didn't want you to go on much longer because every time I hear that story, it sounds to me principally like someone who has a hard time keeping a job. Uh, and let me just say, if you could follow my career in greater depth, you would understand that, in fact, that is true. Uh, it is a remarkable honor to be here. Uh, it's great to be in St. Paul, of course. What's not to love about St. Paul? What's not to love about Minnesota, except maybe your winners uh, and a few of your sports teams? Uh, I know, I know. Uh, I came, uh, I walked in this morning and I'd never been in this building so I looked around for just a minute or two to try and find where the gathering was. This is a fairly large venue if you're just wandering around. But eventually I heard what sounded to me like the strains of a Caribbean steel band and it occurred to me that that was not the meeting of the realtors or the pharmacists. Um, <laughs> this was apt to be the poverty folks. So uh, I drifted that way. I, uh, I'm a huge fan, uh, not only of uh, those who work in this vineyard, but uh, community action agencies generally and uh, of Ramsey and Washington counties in particular. I also have to say as I start, and I hope you'll forgive me for this, it is impossible for me to come to Minnesota. I know you must get tired of this, but uh, uh, I was here maybe six months ago, and then before that, the last time I was here was for the uh, remarkable memorial service for Paul and Sheila Wellstone. Uh, it was uh, one of the high honors of my life to work a great deal with Senator Wellstone and with Sheila for a long time, uh, great heroes to me. It sort of echoes in my ear Senator Wellstone's constant refrain that we cannot accept these huge gaps between the words we say and the policies we pursue, the actions that we take. And maybe most powerfully, over and over again, Paul saying that the largest problem we face in the United States is that so many of us are willing to turn our gaze away from those locked at the bottom of American life. I, I think I'll likely talk about that a little bit this morning. Uh, we hear contrary claims. Uh, we hear presidential candidates brag about not caring about the poor or suggesting that questions of poverty and economic justice should be discussed only in our quiet rooms. Well, I take it that this meeting's premise is sort of the opposite of that. I, I have to say, too, I speak to a lot of poverty gatherings around the country. Uh, my hat is off to you. You have a number of county commissioners here. It is uh, terrific for you to come. Let me just say that is not always true, that uh, county commissioners, school board members, uh, express their concerns about poverty, or a mayor, who I do not know well, but who not only speaks about poverty, but its constant historic handmaiden race, overtly, expressly. Uh, my hat's off to you. My hat's off to you also for, more powerfully, the work that you do every day, the work you have committed to, carrying out Vaclav Havel's definition of hope, which he described not as a prediction of success or a description of the world around us, but a predisposition of the spirit, a predilection of the heart, choosing to live in the belief that we can make a difference in the quality of our shared and sometimes threatened lives. The nobler of contested hypotheses. So my hat is off to you, I am honored to be with you, and I mean that not in the chivalrous sense, but in the literal one. You do our most difficult and frequently uh, most challenging and trying and always our most important work, and it can be hard to remember that from week to week, but if you forget it, when you do, you shortchange yourselves. 
and your calling. I wasn't sure exactly how I should approach this topic, what uh, I was to discuss. I thought I might come and explore with you the chances the Gophers have in the upcoming Frozen Four. But uh, I'm from the South. We don't get as good a coverage of the Frozen Four down in North Carolina, as you might guess. In fact, I didn't know until this morning that there was one. But I, <laughs> I'm well aware there was a final for it, which we did not appear. I also, as the introduction indicated, am a constitutional lawyer, and I was thinking that uh, I spent some time studying the American Constitution. Uh, I was thinking this morning about its you know, few, relatively speaking, amendments, a full, I guess, one-fourth of which, time after time after time, extend very pointedly the right to vote, the right to participate in the political process, first to blacks and to women and then to 18-year-olds and then the direct election of senators. A powerful trend of the American Constitution is the extension of the right to franchise. And then I see that here in uh, Minnesota, you are considering a constitutional amendment, apparently, which might move the other direction, uh, sort of contrarians. So I wanted to come study that and explore that, so uh, maybe you could explain it to me. Uh, I'm also uh, glad to have an important topic, these challenges of equality and equal justice and poverty and community action and equal dignity and full membership and opportunity. For almost all of the last 25 years, I have been either a law school dean or a university president. I was surprised during those long tenures how often presidents are called upon to give what I came to think of as warm and mindless remarks. You know, you've, you've heard them. They're designed to touch the affections and perhaps the pocketbooks of various alumni and friends of their institutions, certainly never to say anything strident or controversial or meaningful or worth listening to. I was surprised how big a part of the job of being a university president the giving of warm and mindless remarks was. But I was even more surprised when my faculty colleagues started explaining to me almost uniformly that I'm really very good at giving warm and mindless remarks, that I'm something of a natural for it. So this is warning that I will depart this morning from my long-standing habits and what are apparently my best talents. But if a little later I forget myself and start asking you for money, please forgive me. Old habits <laughs> die hard. I could say, too, that as I came in, a couple of folks who had read about my background said that I didn't look exactly like they expected a university president to look. I hear that with some frequency as I travel around the country. At first, I took it as a compliment, maybe thinking that I'm not as nerdy or as arrogant as is usually called for in this line of work. But I gradually realized people were just saying, I'm a lot bigger than they ever expected a university president to look. <laughs> I explained this to my wife of 29 years, and she said with great kindness, that I'm a lot bigger than she ever expected me to look either. So uh, <laughs> you are in uh, good company. And you might have noticed much to my chagrin about uh, 10 minutes ago, just before I got up here, they turned the lights up. Uh, I asked them to sort of keep them down. I, I'm one of those people who looks a lot better in low light. So, uh, <laughs> But I want to begin by talking for just a second about this community action mission, all these beautiful, uh, very visible blue t-shirts around the room, these remarkable agencies and people who give voice and effectiveness to poor and threatened and marginalized members of our community, believing in the empowerment of community and the enabling prospect of self-sufficiency. Tracing your roots, as we've heard already even this morning, on this marker of Dr. King, tracing your roots to the war on poverty. I remembered a month ago 
Lyndon Johnson's words in 1965 declaring an, quote, unconditional war on poverty, a war that the richest nation on earth cannot afford to lose. Johnson also began by saying, I don't know if I will pass a single law or fund a single program, but before I'm through, there will not be a community in America that can ignore the poverty in its midst. We have proven more steadfast in our ability to ignore the poverty within our midst than Johnson would have ever predicted or believed. Terry Sanford, our former governor, said we didn't lose that war on poverty, we abandoned the field. But those were telling words, Johnson's, from an American president. God knows it would be nice to hear them again. Almost 50 years ago now, Johnson told the graduating students at the University of Michigan, in a land of great wealth, families must not live in hopeless poverty. In a land rich in harvest, children must not go hungry. In a land of healing miracles, neighbors must not suffer and die unattended. In a great land of learning and scholars, young people must not go uneducated. Being a Texan, I think I could say that it would break his big, complicated Southern heart, his contradictory Southern heart, to know how powerfully still his words are unheeded today. But that's not what my assignment is. I'm not here for a history lesson. There is too much going on for that. The times are too dawning. They are too potentially terrible. It's just those of you with these blue t-shirts, I'd like to remind you from whence you come. 